Good afternoon and welcome to our ground rounds. Uh, I have the pleasure today to have uh, a really good colleague to present a topic that I think is very important. So um, just to remind you, there is, uh, you can post uh, questions in the chat, um, as well as uh, Angel is going to be putting your CME code every so often so that you can kind of uh, get your CME credits. So uh, just a brief introduction to uh, Dr. McGinnis. He's, uh, he attended Duke University uh, for medical school. He did his fellowship at Mass General as well as his vascular and interventional radiology training. Um, he currently practices uh, in a private practice type of setting at Morton uh, Hospital uh, in Massachusetts. Um, he is uh, also part of the American College of Radiology and a board examiner. Um, he's very well involved in the Society of Interventional Radiology in all that has to do with diversity, equity, and inclusion. That's how I met him. Um, I met him at uh, SIR last year. Um, excellent talk about imposter syndrome, and that's the reason why I wanted to share that with you guys uh, and make sure that uh, not only you know about the topic, but you have a, a good understanding of what it is from, from one of the um, passion of Dr. McGinnings, uh, which is uh, that topic. Um, so he's a mentor, he's an educator, and he also knows about um, all of the diversity issues that's going on. Uh, if you can uh, also, I'm gonna plug in the SIR uh, URM section. So please follow that SIR URM section and uh, enjoy the talk, Dr. McGinnis. Thanks everyone, it's very generous. Uh, I wanna have a talk with you today about something that's very different than probably any other talk you've had before. I'm passionate about doing procedures. I could operate all day, every day. And that's what our focus is a lot of the time. But today I wanna talk about things more internal, our internal experience of what it's like to be a surgeon. And then what we can do about some of the things that maybe just aren't meeting our highest needs. I don't have any disclosures. So for me, this journey started at the National SIR meeting in 2018 in Los Angeles. Just so you know, most of these national meetings are important to go to, but they were usually the loneliest week of my life. I rarely talked to anyone. I really wasn't part of the in crowd. I wasn't in academics. I sat in the audience, never even dreamed of presenting. And I would just get the information and go on my way. Except part of every meeting is the business meeting. And I attend this because you're supposed to. You have to vote on certain things. And on, on that Tuesday, that's when everything changed in my career. The career, uh, the executive council was on stage talking about the diversity, equity, and inclusion um, initiatives they were, they were taking on. And um, in that moment, unfortunately, I just needed to speak up. And so this is what happened. I said, you've defined diversity and inclusion in terms of sex, race, and ethnicity. But once again, the LGBT community has been left out. And in 2018, this is unacceptable. Unacceptable. I urge the Executive Council to revisit this issue and consider the true meaning of diversity and inclusion. Will these efforts widen the pathway to opportunity by a few inches? Or will you build a super highway to the future of IR? For the future of this specialty, we can't afford to leave any clinical talent uncultivated, any patient population unserved. Well, this was probably the biggest moment in my professional career. My voice was quavering. And um, when it was over, the council came down. They couldn't have been more generous. They said, of course, they agreed that that's the way things should be. And in Dr. Vicki Mark's inaugural address to society the very next day, she specifically said that sexual orientation and gender identity were indeed included in the society's mission for diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I left the meeting and went home to kind of fade into obscurity, but just life wasn't gonna be like that. I shortly got a phone call from Dr. Harjeet Singh, at Johns Hopkins saying that they needed me to, do, to join the advisory board. And I said, 
there must be a mistake. I can't do that. I'm not an expert in this. I really, I don't have anything to offer. And Dr. Singh said, if not you, who? And so I joined with a lot of anxiety and there was a very steep learning curve. And I found out you don't always have to be an expert, a self-proclaimed expert in something to still have an impact. And so I felt like I was making a difference, but there was trouble on the horizon. It was the 2019 meeting when I was asked to give a talk. Now I'd only sat in the audience. I was not made for the stage. And so initially I thought there must be a mistake. I can't do that. And they said, you can do it. You can. What do you want me to talk about? They said, anything, anything about the LGBTQ population you can talk about. So in Austin, I devised a talk talking about the radiology workforce seen through the LGBTQ lens. Some of you got a little bit of this this morning, morning rounds. And I think the talk was a hit. And unexpectedly, when I returned to the meeting the next morning, I had made the lead story at SIR today. How is this possible? Well, it was possible. And when I was giving my address, I noticed Dr. Dan C was in the audience. He's the editor in chief of JVIR. And he later told me that he was having a dinner and someone asked him what the most impactful talk of the whole meeting was. And he said, it was my talk. And I couldn't believe it. I mean, it's me, right? So I wrote him an email. And I said to him, while I've achieved a great deal of professional success in alleviating human pain and suffering internally, internally, I've experienced a deep and painful sense of unfulfilled potential. Finding mentors, sponsors, and my post-fellowship years proved challenging, and I've struggled to grow. It wasn't until this meeting that I've received the support and encouragement from peers that has sorely been needed. Relatively late in my career, I feel a sense of optimism and energy that I long ago had lost. I've made professional connections sure to fortify and expand my passion for excellence in IR. This is a little embarrassing to reveal. And to me, that part that's underlined, that's like yet the latest blip on a radar that had gone off continuously through my career, telling me that something, something wasn't quite right. Well, trouble came again. Just a couple of months later, I was approached by the British Society of Interventional Radiology to give the keynote address. And once again, I said, there must be a mistake. I can't do that. I reached out to Dan Z and said, Dan, what am I going to do? Dan said, I, he thought I should take the opportunity and run with it. His email to me said, as we hung up after our conversation, it struck me that you start, it, it, your uncertainty sounds like a, a lot like imposter syndrome. Don't be intimidated by persons with longer CVs. You have a message that none of them can deliver. Your talk at SIR was personal and elegant, rational, analytical. I think the BSR audience will appreciate it. Now, I want you to notice he put imposter syndrome in quotation marks, and I laughed. I thought he made it up. I thought it was something that was just invented until... A journal came in the mail just a couple weeks later, and there it is right there, imposter syndrome, a psychological term that refers to a pattern of behavior wherein people, even those with adequate external evidence of success, doubt their abilities or have a persistent fear of being exposed as a fraud. Well, I read this article, and boy, it provoked a lot of thought in me. Do I have imposter syndrome? I didn't know, but I did a lot of research. This term was coined by some psychologists in 1978, I believe in Georgia. They were studying very accomplished businesswomen who had tons of objective signs of success who had an impaired sense of self-worth. They defined it as being a term that refers to a range of feelings, behaviors, and attitudes within high achieving individuals regarding their worthiness. Despite objective displays of success, they may possess persistent self-doubt and anxiety about being exposed as an imposter, a fraud. They believe they are unworthy of their position and other positive perceptions. What, is it, what does it consist of? Fears, of? fears and anxiety regarding feeling inadequate. It impacts emotional well-being and professional functioning. 
And again, I'm going to reinforce, this is found in high achievers who fear being exposed and don't believe in their own true abilities. Now, this can happen transiently, short periods of time, or it can exist as a self-reinforcing cycle that goes on and on. How does it manifest itself? Anxiety, poor self-esteem, self-doubt, frustration, depression, isolation, professional dissatisfaction. But what does it really feel like? I call this the internal voice of imposter syndrome. I could never fill in the blank. I just don't have what it takes. I got here by luck. There must have been a mistake. If they ever found out who I really was, they'd know that I'm a fraud and take it all away. This is what goes through the heads of people who suffer from this. So I wanted to make it more specific. So I turned to some IR colleagues who told me they struggled with this. And this is what they said. I froze. It felt like in the back of my head telling me, you're not smart enough. They're going to find out. And my brain became like a blank slate, despite having reviewed all the steps of the procedure four times that morning. When I have to discuss an unknown case in front of my peers, I fear that I'll get it wrong and be exposed as being stupid and unworthy of being where I am. I hope that hits you at more of a gut level than the theoretical level. Every time I entered the conference room, I had to brush away the feel that brush away the fleeting feeling of being a barely tolerated visitor in a foreign country where I would never be, where, where we'd never belong or welcomed. I call this the imposter hall of fame. These are people who have either self-identified or could have imposter syndrome based on their quotes. Here's Tina Fey faking it with three Emmys, talking about feeling like a complete fraud and saying at the end, she realizes that almost everyone is a fraud, so she tries not to feel too badly about it. Here's Sheryl Sandberg. Every time I didn't embarrass myself or excel, I believe that I had fooled everyone yet again. One day soon, the jig would be up. Here's Tom Hanks faking it with two Oscars back to back, talking about the sharp terror of loss of confidence. When are they going to discover that I am, in fact, a fraud? and take everything away from me. David Bowie, are you kidding me? Well, he certainly sounds like someone who might suffer from imposterism. Self-image problems, low self-esteem, driven to get through life quickly, hiding in obsessive work, and thinking that work was the only thing of value. Gaga, really? Really? I still feel like a loser kid in high school and have to pick myself up and tell myself that I'm a superstar every morning so I can get through the day and be, the, and be for my fans what they need me to be for them. <clears throat> Sonia Sotomayor, I'm always looking over my shoulder, wondering if I measure up. The bad news is this isn't even the basement. We're still in the second mezzanine. We've got a lot further to go. Maya Angelou, I've written 11 books, but each time I think they're going to find out now, I run a game on everyone. They're going to find me out. And this most assuredly has to be the basement. In the final month of his life, Albert Einstein, the exaggerated esteem in which my life work is held makes me very ill at ease. I feel compelled to think of myself as an involuntary swindler. Really? Albert Einstein? You know, we've seen it again more recently. Naomi Osaka, who expressed about her imposterism internally, I think I'm never good enough. I've never told myself I've done a good enough job, but I do know I constantly tell myself that I suck and could do better. And then last summer on the biggest stage the world has to offer, one of the most successful athletes of all time had their imposterism crisis. Simone Biles had to drop out of the Olympics saying she didn't think she belonged there. Time waits for no person. The Olympics moved on. 
her teammate, Suni Lee, went on to win the gold medal, only to announce afterwards she had imposter syndrome. How is this possible? How is this possible? Well, I want to move forward saying that imposterism is imperfectly understood. And there's a lot of terms that float around. It's not really a syndrome, but it's the initial phrase that was coined. Some people call it imposter phenomena, imposterism. I use those a lot. And then I want to talk about what I call the cycle of imposterism. Because this is, this is how I think it operates for a lot of people. My friends at SIR helped me with this. You know, I think a lot of people that suffer from this have this fear of inadequacy. So what do they do? They pour themselves into what they're comfortable with, work. Hard work leads to accomplishments, and those lead to recognition. The approval from the recognition can buoy the person's sense of self-worth, but it's transient. And after a while, it starts to sag. The fear of inadequacy comes in, and again, they plunge themselves back into worth into work. This cycle can be sped up as proceduralists. You can do everything right and have a bad outcome, or an error can be made. That can definitely speed up the cycle. And plunging into work can lead to accelerated burnout, anxiety, depression, poor professional satisfaction. Procrastination also plays a role here. It's not perfectly understood, but the theory is a lot of people with posturism engage in procrastination almost as a way to expose themselves. If they can procrastinate, that people will see that they're a fraud and alleviate the anxiety they're carrying about feeling unworthy. Now, how prevalent is this? I mean, how bad could it be? I mean, the world is functioning fairly well. We're functioning fairly well in our careers. Well, it turns out up to 70% of that population has experienced these feelings. Seems to be pretty common among men and women, but there are gender differences in how it's manifest. Men will oftentimes just avoid situations where they feel like there is a risk that they'll be exposed as being an imposter. Women will more, more, more often delve into these spaces, but then carry the anxiety of being in those competitive spaces. Now, there's five imposter archetypes. These aren't pure, but I think they kind of set the stage. The perfectionist, the expert, the soloist, the genius, and the superhero. Let's start with the perfectionist. You know, this is someone who really focuses on process over outcomes, how things should be done. And no matter what, they think things could have always been done better, even if they have great outcomes. The expert fears not knowing something, really is concerned about being exposed, even over a minor lack of knowledge could fill them with shame, failure, and unworthiness because they feel like there's, they have to know everything. The soloist is concerned about who does the work and believes that asking for help is a sign of weakness. The genius equates competence and being able to do things easily, the first time through, quickly, with an appearance of ease is what's important. And admitting to not understanding or not being able to perform is a sign of failure. And then the superhero. These are people who juggle multiple roles at the same time. They're the pleasers, the one to make everyone happy. The multitaskers committed to needless overtime, but they pay for it in their, in their personal lives with their family and personal well-being often suffering. Where is it in radiology? Well, the only really decent study we have comes out of the Beth Israel Hospital. There was an anonymous survey 40% response rate, significantly more men than women responded to this survey. 83% of respondents said they had symptoms of imposterism. 72% starting as student and trainees, 84% of it grew into their attending years. And almost as predicted, while burnout is rampant, people with imposterism have higher levels of burnout symptoms. What about IR? Well, Dr. Ryu from USC, in this podcast of overcoming imposter syndrome, probably has the best data there is on IR. And it exists in the form of a Twitter poll. This is all there is for IR right now. And here's the straightforward question. 
I have at some point experienced imposter syndrome defined as a fear of exposure as a fraud, success driven by luck, unworthy of position, simple yes or no question. What do you think the number might be? 277 respondents, boom. 87%, are you kidding me? To me, what this means is that there's potentially a large but unacknowledged dynamic going on in our specialty that we have to get a better handle on. Now, what are the secondary impacts of imposterism in the workplace? Well, first of all, imposters are very loyal to institutions. These are the people that come and stay for 20, 25, 30 years. However, they have lower career satisfaction and they're poor at marketing themselves, leading to lower salaries and impaired professional development. So how does this get set up? How does this get into people? There's lots of theories. Low self-esteem, okay. Perfectionism and high achievers, maybe. Past trauma, family dynamics, group roles, and a reaction to interpersonal and societal stressors. I think all of those are valid. I think there's probably multiple causes for imposterism. But my theory is the one that I think that is the one that's probably the biggest cause. I wanna talk about the connection between self-worth and the, and, the, and the notion of accomplishments. These things are separate. These are separate concepts. I think in people with imposterism, these things have gotten linked. And it, this is due to an error in thinking. Now I've thought of a number of ways to represent this. I'm gonna go to like a, what, what, is, what I call an almost closed hydraulic system. In people with imposterism, if their self-worth is flagging, what do they do? They load up on some accomplishments to buoy up their self-worth. Well, if a little bit is good, a lot must be better. And so they do this and the self-worth continues to rise, except this, this system is leaky, okay? The self-worth is always under attack and always, always at risk for failing. And so what do people with imposterism do? They keep loading up on accomplishments and these tasks start to build. So it's not just the number of them, it's the size of them. You have to become more ambitious and do bigger and bigger and bigger things. And in the worst manifestation, this work can take over a person's whole life until really almost all sense of purpose and perspective have been lost. So I said, I think the origin of this for a lot of us comes from a linkage between self-worth and accomplishments. A linkage that I don't think should be there, a linkage that I want to break. You know, to me, the concept of self-worth just comes from our humanity. I believe in the self-worth and dignity of all living things. That's just, we're all given this. It's all, it's imbued in us. Accomplishments, this is the realm of our focus, our passion, our energies, our talents. These things should not be inextricably linked one to another. There's something about how we develop talent and high achievers. They prove that they can attain goals at a very high level, but somehow they're left with an impaired sense of self-worth. And this is happening under an overall culture of systemic bias that none of us created, okay? So they call this the thank God ledge. This is in Yosemite. I call it the please God no ledge. But for me, this is Tuesday. This is just some average day. I'm ambitious enough to climb up there and perform. But there's always some underlying sense that with one error, it could all fall apart and be taken away. So what, what drives imposterism? Well, changes in circumstance. Maybe you get a new job, you get a promotion at work, errors and poor outcomes that we discussed about. Workplace stressors and incentives. You know, maybe there's a new way they give bonuses out at work. Maybe you have a new supervisor. Tendencies of perfectionism. That's something that's within a lot of us. Lack of awareness. That was certainly a dynamic for me. And here are the big ones. Silence, shame, and isolation. Are there cultural drivers of imposterism? Yes, there are. Women racial and ethnic minorities and sexual and gender minorities and those from low socioeconomic levels are really susceptible. 
their very presence in a new environment where they have low representation can inform them that they are out of place. They're an imposter. And many people in this group, even from well-intentioned people, will say things like, you have to be twice as good and work twice as hard to get just as far. Meaning to be helpful, but in the end, can any of us really work twice as hard and be twice as good? It sets an almost impossible standard. I found this to be very interesting. Kevin Coakley at the University of Texas, Austin, in studying imposterism, found that imposterism, imposterism was a greater predictor of negative mental health outcomes of minorities than overt discrimination was in the workplace. I'm gonna say that again. Imposterism was a greater predictor of negative mental health outcomes than overt discrimination. Workplace anxiety, depression, diminished professional satisfaction were all driven higher by imposterism. Now, as a proceduralist, I wanna measure things, I wanna quantify things, and there are all sorts of scales to measure tendencies towards imposterism. I think this Clance imposter self-assessment tool is probably the easiest one. It's 10 questions, five points scale. And you know, the higher your score, the more frequently uh, an individual will have imposter experiences. I was talking to an SIR gold medalist about this and he was unswayed. He says, I don't know. This sounds just like self-doubt to me. He, he's a well-intentioned person, but he just wasn't quite believing yet that imposterism could be as rampant or as impactful as I thought it might be. And I thought about it after a while. I said, you know, self-doubt is really how you think. Imposterism is how you feel. It's how you behave. I want to talk to you about three concepts of what it's like to be a surgeon, a proceduralist like us. You know, I want to talk about the narcissistic practitioner. This is hyperbolic, but it's just an example. We've met some people like this perhaps in our career. I can do anything, anytime I want with no fear or consequences whatsoever. That's not the kind of practitioner I would want treating me, not the kind of practitioner I aspire to be. Okay, here's an uncompensated imposter practitioner. I don't think I can do this. I'm not prepared to do this. If there's a bad outcome, everyone will finally know that I'm a fraud. If there's a bad outcome, I deserve to be fired. You know, this isn't the kind of practitioner I'd want either, and not the kind of practitioner I'd want to be. I want to look at what I call the balanced practitioner. I think I can do this. I know how to do this. I've prepared to do this. I'm a big believer in preparation. If I can't execute my plan, I have a backup plan. If there's a poor outcome, it's not a definitive reflection on my overall abilities or worth. If there's a poor outcome, I'm still confident I'll find success in the future. This is where I want to exist as a practitioner. And this is the kind of person I want working for me. So I asked a while ago, do I have imposter syndrome? Well, I've got to go back and tell you, when I said I didn't have a disclosure, I was wrong. I do have a disclosure. I suffer from imposter syndrome. Sorry. So what I ask myself in situations like this is where's the hope? Where is the hope? As someone who solves problems professionally, I never want to be so deep in the problem that I can't find the way out. So look to the work of Kamara P. Jones, who examines bias as a public health crisis. And she has this model that says, basically bias can be exercised internally, interpersonally, or systemically through institutions. So I thought, well, you know, let's take that framework and see if I can use that to form solutions to imposterism, okay? So let's start with internal. These are the things we can do for ourselves. Well, we can use denial, we can use procrastination and self-sabotage in all of its forms. I call these the dysfunctional low self-esteem mechanisms. These are probably the ones that are used most often and I don't subscribe to any of these. I think we should just take these and just tear them up and get rid of them. And look at this from a high self-esteem perspective. First of all, do what we're doing now. 
develop an awareness of the cycle. And for each of us, understand are there certain triggers that make it worse or better? Maybe just take a log of your achievements and take time to appreciate the impact of all the good work that you've done through your career. Recognize impulses for overcommitment. Just because someone asks you to do something doesn't mean you have to say yes if it doesn't align with what your goals are and where your energies are at the time. Accept that poor outcomes and errors are an inherent part of being a practitioner. You don't have to do something wrong. You don't have to have make, made an error for someone to have a bad outcome. It's not always your fault. Develop strategies for negative self-talk. This is a big one. Some of the things we say internally to ourselves are far more harsh than what we would ever allow any friend or family member or coworker to say to us. I don't belong here. If that's what you're saying, try to turn that around. Know that where you're going is more important than where you came from. There's another one. Everyone knew the answer but me. I'm so dumb. What I'd say is every expert you admire wants to do nothing about the area in which they have expertise. Just because you got something wrong once doesn't mean that you're not going to know it forever. Have a growth mindset. Go from the I don't know to I don't know yet. Don't allow negative comments from others to define your innate sense of worth. We discussed that this morning. A gift my best friend gave me was telling me what other people think of me is none of my business. It frees me profoundly. Understand the role of perfectionism in your professional practice and development and resist the instinct to compare yourselves to others. I love this quote. We compare our innermost criticized version of ourselves with everyone else's outwardly portrayed version of themselves. It's not a fair comparison, not at all. Confront, I could never do that ways of thinking. Confront self-doubt with self-reflection. And this one, change the narrative. The question you're burdening yourself with is, am I good enough? Have I achieved enough? Or am I a fraud? Change that to, is the work I'm doing helpful to someone? Am I making a difference? If you can say yes to those last two questions, you're probably in a place where you can really continue to do a lot of good for your patients and for yourself. And lastly, be good to yourself. Training programs are rigorous, but it's not all about work. If you don't start taking care of yourself during your training years, how are you going to incorporate that into your life when you're deeper in your career? Okay, what about the interpersonal things? The things that we can do between other people? Well, professional coaches and workplace mentors can be great resources. Like they recognize the likelihood that imposterism exists widely in our peer groups, form small groups. Partnerships with peers of people who have similar temperaments can be fantastic ways to help inspire each other and support each other to develop your career. And as I said before, cultivating small work groups can be a really nice way to just talk to each other about not just what you're doing, what you're feeling, and to offer a lot of support. Perhaps you're going to have a book group. Barbara, Barbara Hamilton is at IR out of uh, Palm Springs, California. She wrote this book, Save Lives, Enjoy Your Own. It's been great. Or maybe the other book is a way to kind of build some confidence. Find ways to express criticism in a way that is constructive and not humiliating, degrading, or hum dehumanizing. You know, disagreements are just part of work life, right? But there could be supportive ways that we can express criticism especially in private places between just the parties that are involved and not do it in front of the whole department in ways where people's sense of self-worth can be permanently impaired. And here's one. 
express positive feedback and appreciation with team members contemporaneously is when it happens. This has been found to be something that is one of the biggest builders of strong teams is positive feedback given in public for forums contemporaneously as to when it happens and develop the ability to ask for help. Now, what can institutions do? Well, the reason why I'm talking to you, and we have a lot of trainees here, is that I see you as our future leaders. You're the ones that are going to be the ones making the decisions that affect the culture of departments that many people work. I would say include education and training about imposterism in the curriculum. Be aware that women, racial and ethnic minorities, and sexual and gender minorities are more prone to imposterism, not because of anything that any one person has done, but because we exist within a rubric of systemic bias. When new members join the team, hardwire supports and mentoring to the onboarding process. I know when I started my first job, they showed me where the reading room was, where the procedure room was, and that was about it. Urge new practitioners to ease into the mainstream and learn the nuances with a mentor. And what I would say is if someone were to have a poor outcome early in their tenure, it can be really detrimental to the whole team. The practitioner could have an impaired sense of worth and the team that works with them could not have the sense of trust that they need in order to be strong. Develop an awareness of the tireless high achievers in your group. I would say that to, to, uh, to leaders. When they have new projects, don't just go to those people. Be thoughtful. Look to other people. Try to find other nascent talent to develop and give opportunities to. Encourage leadership styles where individuals are recognized beyond praise, beyond the typical you know, performance evaluations, pieces of paper. Be a keen observer of a workplace environment and offer, offer real-time positive feedback. Just talk about this and expressions of appreciation with team members among their peers. Consider shifting from peer review to peer learning. I talked about this with someone recently. They said peer review has turned into a blood sport, a humiliating form among their peers. And another colleague of mine has incorporated team debriefings after significant events. So again, someone has a bad outcome or something happens during a procedure. They don't just take care of it and then move on to the next patient. They all come together as a team just to talk about how everyone's feeling, to talk about if anyone has any insights as to the whys behind why the event happened so they can grow and still have confidence in each other and just acknowledge they've been through something that's difficult. And this one, structure the work schedule and workplace culture to allow and encourage time for adequate self-care. I think this is the biggest challenge before us as IRs, is how can we be strong in taking care of our patients and also still be strong enough to take good care of ourselves? This is the tough one. So realize this is where we started, this voice of imposterism in IR. This is where I hope we can transform practitioners into being. This is a, a mid-career IR that said, in cases that I'm competent at, I'm confident enough. Cases which felt to me like they had more writing on them with risks of bad outcomes, I had more self-doubt and anxiety, fear of complications. What has helped me the most in this arena is reevaluating just how negatively I judged myself and how I took bad outcomes too personally. I'm now much more able to simply do my best and have that be okay. No one wants bad outcomes, but now when they happen, they no longer shake me to my core. Hopefully I can learn something from them, but they won't break me. So this to me is someone who sounds like they've really grappled with it and have found ways to make some, some peace with their imposterism and, and be impactful. When I give talks like this, what I'm hoping it'll be is really a call to action. We have very little data about this, but the data that we have it suggests that this is, again, a very prevalent but largely unacknowledged and untreated dimension to what's going on in our specialty. And by elevating the awareness and doing research, I think we have a chance at having people have higher professional satisfaction and achievement. 
And I want to, as we're getting near the end of things, just have you focus on this. Problems that affect a very small number of people, 1%, 5%, 7%, maybe you can say that's an individual problem. When we're talking about problems that are affecting 30, 50, 70, 80% of people in a group, that's no longer a personal problem. This is a personal manifestation of systemic cultural problems. And I want to say that again. It's a personal manifestation of systemic cultural problems. And that's why I use that three-tier approach. It's not enough to just change what's in us. We need to change institutions and the rules of which we abide by if we're going to really get a handle on this. So going back to that meeting in 2018, this was the confrontation. This is what I laid down in front of the executive council. And in the past four years, I've transformed it into what I call the commitment to leave no clinical talent uncultivated, no patient population unserved. That's why I do this work. It's really important to me, not just the how we do it, but how we feel about what we do, how we treat one another. I also told you before that I didn't have any disclosures and I disclosed I had imposter syndrome. And I wanna disclose something else. It doesn't just affect me in my professional life, it affects me in other dimensions of my life. Now, I'm a runner. Okay, I'm a darn good runner. It turns out I got in some negative self-talk or well, negative talk directed towards me as a kid. I was told I was slow. I was no good. And I believed it. And I tried and failed at running in my teens and my 20s. And when I was 54 years old, someone told me, I see a runner in you. And I started to run. I'm telling you, I run every Tuesday night with a group of people 20 and 30 years younger than me. And every Tuesday night, I wipe the floor with them. How is it possible that for 54 years, I thought I couldn't run? I ran my first international competitive race and came in seventh in my age group. No coach, just me and a pair of shoes. But boy, I had really absorbed this message. Every time I go out for a road run though, I'm filled with anxiety. For my Sunday run, the anxiety starts Friday and builds through Saturday. And every Sunday morning, I think I just don't have it. And races are even worse. Sometimes I'm racked with anxiety for a month before my races. Except last year, I was entering my race. I was taking off. My coach said to me, I want you to run with the confidence of your preparation. He didn't say run hard, run fast, kill yourself. He says, I want you to run with the confidence of your preparation. And what I know is me, I prepare. Okay, it changed everything. I set a personal record that day. And when we had our URM and IR section meeting, I talked about imposterism, not knowing that it was gonna elicit a huge response. And so many trainees and students expressed their struggles with imposterism. I've been working in a space for 30 years about workplace develop workforce development. And I thought I knew it, but I didn't. I'd been focusing a lot on representation, just looking at the representation of the workforce. But then I figured out, you know, that's not what's really important. If we're cultivating a workforce who's burned out, anxious, has low career satisfaction, we haven't done enough. We need to have people finish their training programs being energized, and optimistic and just enthusiastic about where they are and what lies before them in their career. And what I would say is, I want you to finish your training hungry, not thirsty. My coach said to me, I want you to run with the confidence of your preparation. This quote is very much about running. It's also very much not about running. Maybe for each of you, what I wanna leave you with is a vision for shared success where you can practice with the confidence of your preparation and own the ground upon which you stand. Own the ground upon which you stand. No one gave this to you. 
You worked hard for this. You sacrificed. There were struggles. There were setbacks. You persevered. Own the ground upon which you stand. I told you each time these opportunities were presented to me, my internal voice said, there must be a mistake. I can't do that. I believe something very different today. I believe that each and every one of us was meant to be here on this day, at this time, to hear this message. And there's no mistake about it. And I believe that each and every one of us has what it takes to get it done. I want to thank you all for giving me your time and attention today. I hope this is going to make a difference in your lives as surgeons. And I'll leave you with this. If you want something you've never had, you have to do something you've never done. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know if you guys have any questions that he can uh, answer, but he's uh, open for questions and we'll take a look at the chat as well um, to make sure. You want to yep. answer to I'm that? Taking that in. I'm taking that in. <laughs> <laughs> Long-term discrimination over generations may lead to imposterism in a community. They are being raised with many cultural codes of inferiority, and this is the success of rulers who discriminate against this particular community, group of people, ethnicity, et cetera. So I think I said this earlier to some people. I said it last night. As you know, no one here created this, this culture. We inherited so much of this. This is about millions of individual decisions being exercised over hundreds of years. My optimism has to come from believing that if we can make those types of decisions, if we consciously make better decisions, many people over many years, we can bend things in a different direction so people aren't addled with these feelings of inferiority. <laughs> this was great. Thank, Thank you very much, Dr. McGinnis. And uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. And I can always forward uh, him the information. And hopefully we can have a open dialogue um, online. Right. Thank you very much, guys.